Well, welcome to Christ and Culture. My name is Pastor Jeff Short, and today I'm at the Chautauqua Institution out here in New York, in western New York, on a beautiful fall day today. Today is the first day of October, and I wanted to continue on with our theme. If you remember in previous episodes, we're talking about the Reformation. This year is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation and I wanted to take some time out to talk more about that Protestant Reformation and today I wanted to talk about the creeds uh, the creeds of the Reformation uh, these are the famous statements of faith that sprung up <clears throat> pretty spontaneous after uh, Luther and his 95 theses it's interesting that the Protestant Reformation really started with a document. It started with the 95 Thesis of Martin Luther, nailed to the door of Wittenberg. And if you go back and you try to read those uh, 95 Theses, you're going to be shocked to find out that a lot of them, even most of them, are just totally, um, almost irrelevant as far as the Protestant Catholic debate. Um, and you, you, you wonder why. Well, you have to consider the context. Uh, at that point, Martin Luther was still a Roman Catholic. He still was uh, basically um, a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, and he was operating under the system of Roman Catholicism and so his main objection was the sale of indulgences and so his main beef with that thesis was to basically question the authority of the Pope and the Roman Catholic hierarchy to impose these uh, indulgence tickets on the people uh, for time out of purgatory that was basically the idea an indulgence is basically a time out of purgatory in the Catholic doctrine purgatory basically teaches that uh, a saved person someone who is already going to heaven will have to go to purgatory to get their sins uh, purged away or cleansed away and that's the purpose of purgatory is to basically uh, purge them of any remaining sins so that when they go into heaven they're all set they don't have all these sins that have to be dealt with because they've already been dealt with uh, in purgatory so that's the purpose of purgatory but what was taking place is that men were going around, specifically one notorious indulgence hawker, um, Tetzel, and they were saying, if you pay me money, pay the church money, uh, you will be able to release not only your own soul from purgatory for a certain amount of time, you will be able to remove your grandmother or your father or mother who are deceased that are probably in purgatory you have to you'll be able to, to get time off for them and they won't have to suffer as much in purgatory so luther reacted and rightly so reacted with indignation and he opposed the sale of indulgences and so in order to spark a debate on that subject he then nailed the 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg. And that's what started the Protestant Revolution and the Reformation. Well, what happened there was that there began to come a massive amount of writing from Luther. And he began to write down all of his uh, Protestant uh, ideas, uh, Sola Scriptura, began to write down all of the ideas that would eventually come out further on down the road of the Reformation. 
and we would see others pick up the pen and probably the most famous one would be uh, the reformed theologian John Calvin and Calvin was the theologian that really systematized things for the Protestant uh, Reformation. Luther not so much of a systematic theologian it was more of a biblical theologian who would take a specific doctrine and he would hammer away at that doctrine you know, with scripture. He would go to the passages, he would refute the erroneous uh, understandings of that passage, and then he would expound his own view of that passage, his own understanding of that passage. And that was his style. Now, John Calvin, when he came along, he was a second generation Reformation uh, theologian. He would come along and in a more calm, systematic, uh, methodical way, he would expound the scripture. And he did this on almost every book of the Bible. And his most famous work is Calvin's Institutes. And it's basically laying out the entire Christian doctrine and Christian life as much as you can in simply a systematic work. Um, he was trying to explain what the Reformation held to. And so you would have Calvin coming along in very calm, methodical, uh, writings as opposed to Luther who was like I said before more interested in correcting errors and uh, was more interested in getting the truth out there not so much point by point um, verse by verse but more uh, just getting the correct doctrine especially around the doctrine of the gospel salvation you know, how is it that we are saved? And uh, he was the one that rediscovered, that had been neglected a long time, the great doctrine of sola fide, faith alone saves us. It's not a combination of faith and works like the Roman Catholic Church teaches, still teaches. You see, Rome doesn't deny grace doesn't deny faith, but says that God gives you the grace inside of you, and then you have to act on that grace to be saved. And you have to do the works that are required by God as you are enabled by the Holy Spirit. So it's not a crude works righteousness system, but it is a works righteousness system because you are doing the works that are pleasing to God. And Luther says, no, the Bible teaches we're saved by faith alone, not by works. So it doesn't matter if it's infused grace that's assisting you or whether it's human grace, human uh, effort alone or whatever, you are not saved by your works. You're saved by the grace of God alone. Works follow naturally, but they're not the cause of justification. God's grace is the only cause of justification. So Luther wrote a lot on that. In fact, Luther wrote and wrote and wrote, and there are so many volumes of Luther's works today. And this really set the tone for the Protestant Reformation because we see, uh, like I said before, John Calvin picking up the pen, the next generation, and writing a lot. Uh, systematic works, commentaries, all kinds of things. So he was, um, he was concerned, he wanted to clarify things. Well, you get this idea of clarification coming in right away uh, because obviously the Reformation was challenging Roman Catholic Church and really the burden of proof was on the Reformation theologians to try to show that what they were teaching was in fact 
the true church and the true faith. And so they picked up the pen and they wrote and they wrote and they wrote. And one of the great results of all this writing by Pro Protestant uh, Reformation theologians was that it produced what is called an article of faith or a profession of faith. And you see these, there are maybe six or seven famous articles of faith. I think one of the earliest was the Augsburg Confession written up by uh, Lutheran theologians. And you have many of the major themes of the Protestant Reformation found in the Augsburg Confession. And then you have later on, you have different uh, other confessions. You have the uh, Westminster Confession later on that lays out the principles of the Reformed Church. A little bit different than Lutheran, but very similar. And then you have others that follow. Um, also, you have the uh, Belgic Confessions, you have the Canons of Dort, you have the Savoy Declaration, you have the Articles of Faith of the Church of England, and you, you, you have enough material here that you can actually read uh, books that have these reprinted, and you can go along and actually um, uh, go through and cover some of these things. So that's what we're going to do a little bit today. I want to just point out some of the uh, highlights of some of these statements of faith. And the first one we're going to start with is the uh, Augsburg Confession. And this is a Lutheran document, and it basically contains um, Luther, Lutheranism in a nutshell. And I want to just go through here, so let's, uh, let's get into that right now. Okay, this is the Augsburg Confession of Faith, uh, put forth by the Lutheran theologians in 1530. It's found in the Book of Concord, which is a compilation of many Lutheran theological confessions and writings, and one in which all of the Lutheran ministers must adhere to. And now it says here, it, we read in 1530, this was presented to the Ro Holy Roman Emperor Charles V at the Diet of Augsburg. Now, if you look at the date, 1530, uh, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg in 1517, marking the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And in 1530, uh, not too long after that, the theologians, uh, Lutheran theologians, submitted this confession to the emperor of the so-called Roman Empire. And this is what they basically said. They were trying to argue that uh, Christianity, the Protestant Christian doctrines were more closely in line with original Christianity, that they are not heretics, that they are not deviating from the Holy Bible, but in fact they're more in line with the Bible than the Roman Catholic Church. So they, they're trying to justify the split with Rome and also unify all the other different uh, Lutheran churches and Re Reformation churches in the, in the area, in Germany. So they wanted unity because they realized that unless they were united in doctrine, uh, they would not be able to survive against the dominant Roman Catholic Church. So they formulated a confession of faith that was general enough and yet specific enough to define um, the Reformation faith for everyone. And the Augsburg Confession pretty much does that. It's a really great summary of Reformation theology. And so we're just going to take a few minutes to look it over today. It opens with a preface to the uh, empire, uh, Roman Emperor Charles V, gives the justification for submitting this. He had called for uh, the princes of the area to submit theological writings, and this is the one that was submitted. 
And so it goes into some basic theology here that would not find disagreement with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, for example, the first article of God, this is pretty standard uh, definition. You could find it in the Council of Nicaea, for example. And so there would really be no disagreement with uh, the Roman Catholic Church on this point. It does mention subgroups that would disagree, and and they are heretical groups uh, historically in the Christianity. The Manichaeans, you see the Arians, Arianism, Arius of Alexander in the uh, 5th century, 4th and 5th century, uh, the heresy that is still with us today in the Jehovah's Witnesses. So they were battling some of the same heretical tendencies. And then Mohammedans, they lump Islam with the heretics. Uh, they see it as more of a heretical uh, Christian movement than anything else, which in the history of Islam, uh, Muhammad probably never read an entire, uh, probably couldn't read uh, as far as the historical record goes. Um, we know that he probably didn't have a knowledge of reading, and he probably never saw a New Testament, never heard a New Testament, only bits and pieces of Christianity, and probably even heretical Christianity at that, some some fringe groups. So they list the uh, Mohammedans, uh, Muslims, as heretics, and that's definitely for sure. Um, even as far as uh, they could have put a totally separate religion, but they didn't. Articles of Faith 2 uh, talk about original sin. Again, that's standard uh, Christian theology. Uh, no real disagreement with Rome on this. Uh, they deny the Pelagian doctrine that humans can justify themselves before God on their own strength and reason, as would the Roman Catholics. Uh, deny uh, pure Pelagianism. The Son of God, definition of Jesus, yes, very solid. Um, no, probably no contradiction with Rome on that. Now, the justification article number four is very important in the Augsburg Confession. This is where Rome would disagree and did disagree later on in their, their council and the counter council, council of the Roman uh, Catholic Church where they specifically state that uh, justification by faith uh, alone is in error. Well here the Augsburg Confession is stating that it is the heart of the gospel. It says also they teach, that is uh, the Lutheran reformers teach that men cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merits, or works but are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake who by his death has made satisfaction for our sins. This faith God imputes for righteousness in his sight, Romans 3 and 4. So that word imputes, that is distinctively Lutheran. Martin Luther wrote extensively on the imputation of righteousness to the believer. Christ's righteousness is imputed to the sinner uh, when they put their faith in him, and then the, the sins of the sinner are put upon Christ on the cross as atonement. So that is a very, very important article, uh, probably the most important article of the whole Augsburg Confession. Then it goes down, talks about the ministry, it wants to set straight the uh, teaching ministry of the church. There's a lot it could have said, but it wants to try, the confession wants to try to stay simple and concise. It says that they condemn the Anabaptists and others who think the Holy Spirit comes to men without external, the external word through their own preparations and works. That is a reaction against, there were groups um, that went really far off the reservation called Anabaptists and they were some of the some of these groups now they're not all of one type they were all just a hodgepodge of different uh, conflicting views but well, uh, a major uh, movement within Anabaptists was that the direct revelation of the Holy Spirit upon the human heart is the 
chief authority of the Christian. So they would even see that the direct revelation of the heart of the, from the Holy Spirit uh, was above the, the scriptures because they would argue that the scriptures were when the prophets and the holy men of God who wrote these things down, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so what is authoritative is that direct inspiration. And the reformers realized, hey, the word of God is the authority. And that comes out in the doctrine of sola scriptura. So uh, that's a hallmark of the Reformation itself. It's not that the Holy Spirit can't lead men directly through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually does lead people through the Holy Spirit. But it's not above the word. The word has the authority over all so-called uh, leadings or direct revelations talks about being obedient also they the reformers teach that this faith is bound to bring good works and good fruits and it is necessary to do good works commanded by God because of God's will but that we should not rely on those works to merit justification before God for remission of sins and justification is apprehended by faith so this is in response to Rome that teaches infused righteousness. You have to cooperate with the grace that is given you. You can't just rely on that grace. You have to cooperate with it. So you are actually meriting your own salvation through cooperation with the grace that God gives you through the sacraments of the church. That is repudiated by the Reformation theologians, and they say so in Article 6. And then they talk about the church what is the true church they wanted to make it clear that the visible church of rome is not the true gospel new testament church that that church in rome has had so many things added to it and that the true church it says here the church is the congregation of saints in which the gospel is rightly taught and the sacraments are rightly administered so it makes it very simple it's not this complicated institution uh, set up by a combination of historical forces and the Roman Empire uh, a thousand or so years ago. It's the New Testament simple church of Jesus Christ and the disciples. So then it goes on, what is a church baptism? Now here's a point that many evangelicals, myself included, would disagree with. The Augsburg Confession, love the Augsburg Confession, but I disagree with this point. It says, of baptism, they teach that it is necessary to salvation, that through baptism is offered the grace of God, and that children are to be baptized, who being offered to God through baptism are received into God's grace. They condemn the Anabaptists who reject the baptism of children. Actually, if you look in the Bible and do a thorough study of baptism, you will never find one child baptized. Um, you, you can infer it possibly from the word households. Wherever you see the word household, it says the household would baptize. You could say, well, there's probably children in that household. But there's no direct evidence of an infant being baptized in the Bible. So, uh, this point I disagree with. Many evangelicals do. But the Augsburg Confession, still a good, solid, solid confession. So, then it goes down. Lord's Supper, confession, repentance, and so on and so forth. It goes down here. Some very interesting things. I hope this has whetted your appetite to go online and to look at this document and see for yourself um, how good it is and to, to, really, to really dig deeper in this. And I think you'll agree that it is uh, something that we can all learn and be discipled by. Well, as you can see, having gone through the the Augsburg Confession, there's a lot there. And one of the great things, and this was pointed out by a, an, an Irish churchman named Paul Flynn, who has a uh, television program, a uh, Christian television program, in a program called uh, Megiddo Radio, Megiddo Radio, and Megiddo TV. Uh, he pointed out that one of the great uh, means of discipleship in the church is simply reading through the confessions of faith. If you just simply go through the confessions of faith, you will be 
uh, amazed at how much depth there is there. You'd be, you'll be amazed at how much richness there is there. If you just simply go through uh, the Confessions of Faith, for example, take the Augsburg Confession that was put out by the uh, Lutheran, early Lutheran theologians. Take that and simply walk through that uh, as it defines things uh, important to the faith like uh, God and other important topics, salvation, means of salvation. Now there are differences that Protestants will find with these confessions. For example, as a Baptist, as an Evangelical Baptist, I would definitely uh, disagree with the Augsburg Confession on the means of baptism. I would not be in favor of, and I don't accept the arguments for, uh, baptism of babies and infants. Even though myself, as a baby, I was baptized, sprinkled. Um, if I go back to the scripture, uh, I will find that there is not a strong case for that. But the Augsburg Confession affirms infant baptism. Whether that is because these uh, Lutheran theologians found it in the Bible, or whether it was simply something that was assumed by almost every Christian at the time, and it wasn't something they wanted to uh, fight and die on that hill, they affirm it. And I would disagree with that. But there is a lot of richness in these confessions, and even if you don't accept every point in the confession, you can appreciate what they're doing, laying out the faith, particularly the gospel sections, faith alone, sola scriptura, that kind of thing. You will be greatly helped in your discipleship. So I hope that's helped you, and we'll see you back here next week on another edition of Christ and Culture.